I would like to start my talk by thanking the organizers uh, for the possibility to um, present our work here. So let's start. Uh, transcriptomics enables a better understanding of the transcription landscape of cells. We can therefore also say we can see how cells react to threats and conditions. We use transcriptomics very often in cancer research. This can be for the identification of cancer biomarkers, as well as for transcription regulation and analysis. Another point where we can use transcriptomics is the, to better understand cellular differentiation. Well, for existing tools for short read sequencing data, there exist several reference-based and reference-free tools already. However, for long read sequencing data, there exist some reference-based tools such as string type 2 and isoquant. However, the LR-GAS consortium found a large discrepancy in isoform detection between tools. The only published reference free tools up to this point are Rattle and RNA Bloom 2, with RNA Bloom 2 just having been re released some weeks ago. Our contribution is Isonform, a long read reference free transcript reconstruction tool. Here you can see our approach to a long read transcriptome analysis pipeline. So here you can see we start with a set of ONT reads. The different colors here represent different um, the, uh, the, the reads belonging to different gene families. So first we cluster the reads by gene family. This can be done by Isomclast, which was introduced by Salin and Medvedev in 2020. In the next step, we then correct the reads. Correcting means that we actually get rid of sequencing artifacts that may have been introduced to the data. This can be done using ISOM correct that has been introduced by Salin and Medvedev in 2021. The final step of our pipeline, the step that I will now focus on is the generation of non-redundant transcripts from those sets of corrected reads per gene family. This is the ISOM form algorithm. So here you can see an overview of our algorithm. We start out with a corrected read cluster. So this is a cluster. This is a set of reads that belong to one gene family. And we generate minimizers for those reads. Minimizers are um, KMER subsampling structures that are very common in our field. So what you can see here is that we can have intact minimizers and also destroyed minimizers. Here, those hatched boxes represent those. A minimizer is, we, we call a minimizer destroyed if, for example, a sequencing error uh, changed the minimizer's sequence. And therefore, we don't have the original minimizer sequence for this read anymore. The next step is then to find minimizer intervals inside a length threshold. So the idea here is that we take two minimizers as anchors, and if they are not too far apart or too uh, close together, we uh, appoint them to an interval. Now we will all, always talk about those minimizer intervals. So then we also calculate a weight, which is done by taking the number of occurrences of each interval in the whole data set times the length of the interval. With that, we then can um, formulate a weighted interval scheduling problem, a well-known problem in computer science that we solve to then find a set of intervals for each read that covers the read best. With that information, then we can generate a directed acyclic graph from those intervals. We do this by first introducing a source node S and a sync node T. Now the idea is to um, find or to generate paths between S and T for each read. This means that we now start adding those intervals, uh, uh, adding nodes representing each interval. So here you can see the blue-green interval is represented also by this blue-green node. We continue with the green-red node, and for each um, interval, we now add a node for read one. For read two, we now have this blue-green hatched node uh, interval, and therefore we also add a new blue-green hatched node. We also have this green hatched red interval here, and also add therefore this green hatched red node. 
Now we can see that read one and read two have uh, the red, purple interval in common. And therefore we don't add a new note for this read. However, we add the information of this read to this note. The same we do for the purple yellow note. And so you can see how we uh, slowly start to build up our graph. And there are already some relations between the reads. The next step is then to simplify the graph via iterative bubble popping. I will explain to you on the next slide what iterative bubble popping is and show you an example how it can simplify a graph. So the next step would then be to trace the ST paths that are fully supported by reads, meaning we find all paths that are supported by a read fully. So that are supported the whole path through by at least one read. With that, here we would find three consensuses in our data set. However, there still exists a high start and end variability between those um, consensuses, which are, are also possible sequencing artifacts. Due to that, we also perform a post-processing step that then actually generates the final isoform predictions. As I already told you, two predictions are in this data set. So now I want to show you how iterative bubble popping works. You can see here a very simple graph with the start node S and the end node T. And now first, what is a bubble? Well, a bubble is a graph substructure with a bubble start node, here it is A, and a bubble end node, here it is D. Those, the bubble start and end nodes are connected by two um, disjoint paths of um, nodes or by, by two just disjoint paths. So here, this would just be um, the upper path would be going through B and the lower pa pa path would go to C. Now we pop the bubble by linearizing the nodes, reordering them. The idea of this is that we now, um, the different re the, the reads that had here different paths from A to D now get the same common path A, B, C, D. Now you can see that our graph has more bubbles that we can pop. So now we find this bubble S to E that we also uh, want to pop by linearizing it. So here you can see the linearized bubble. And you can see still there is still a bubble in our node, uh, in our graph. This we can also pop and therefore we can have a fully linearized graph here. This is a very simple example, however, I think it explains nicely what iterative bubble popping can do to a graph and how it can help us find uh, consensuses from the data. Now I want to talk to you about our analysis. So first of all, we perform a precision recall analysis. We define true positive if a prediction aligns correctly to a ground truth isoform. False positive would be if more than one prediction aligned to the same ground truth isoform. A false negative is if a ground truth isoform has no aligned prediction to it. Now uh, we also use the notion of completeness where we say a full reconstruction is if the transcript was reconstructed with at least 95% of its original length. So on this slide, you can see our analysis pipelines. I will uh, explain them step by step, but first we can, um, you can see that we have a SIM, so a simulated pipeline, a SURF analysis pipeline, and a biological data pipeline. So let's look into the SIM pipeline. Well, for the SIM pipeline, we simulate a sequence by just having a random sequence of characters A, C, T, G, and then, um, generate, uh, and then chopping this sequence into short subsequences. Those short subsequences represent the axons of this data set. We therefore generate different combinations of those subsequences, which are then our transcripts. Then we generate reads from those transcripts by adding some errors, by having several reads for one transcript, and then running the ISON pipeline as well as the rattle pipeline to then get our precision recall values. Here you can see the results of this analysis. So here we, on the x-axis, we have the number of isoforms. And on the y-axis, we have the precision, respective the recall value. What you can see here is that um, both tools have an almost perfect precision with rattle 
being closer to perfectness than isomform. For the recall, however, we can see that isomform is still almost perfect, while Rattle with a higher number of isoforms is not able to find all the transcripts in the data set. Also, we found that isomform was able to complete 99% of complete, um, or, or to, to get 99% of complete reconstructions, while Rattle was only able to get 93% of complete reconstructions from the data. Well, sorry. Um, the next analysis is the SURF analysis. This is the spike in RNA variant data set. The idea here is that those um, that this uh, sequence was generated by people in the lab. And also the transcripts were generated in a lab from um, scientists. However, those scientists now used um, Oxford nanopore sequencing on those transcripts to then get a set of reads. Those reads are now, um, for those reads, we still have the ground truth. However, they have the actual sequencing artifacts in them. So they are closer to the true biological data set. Now we again use the ISOM pipeline as well as the RATL pipeline to again get a precision recall measure or analysis. Here you can see the results of this analysis. Again, um, the same structure of our graphs and also they paint the same picture as, also for, as we had for the SIM data set. So you can see that isomform as well as rattle have almost perfect precision with isomform falling a bit short to rattle. However, for the recall, isomform stays a lot better, uh, finds a lot more transcripts than rattle does. So rattle just with a higher number of isoforms also finds less of them in the data. Again, isomform was able to find 99% um, of complete reconstructions well, Rattle was only able to get 93% of complete reconstructions from the data. We also performed another analysis on the SURF data set that we don't have in this talk. However, what we found there is that for 100,000 SURF reads, Isonform was able to find 62 of the 63 transcripts in the data. However, Rattle was only able to find 19 of the 63 data sets there. So now we want to look into biological data. So this is now the real data, so to say. Um, however, for this data set, we do not have a ground truth anymore. We therefore use a reference and gene annotation to, to run string type, a reference base tool, which now forms our gold standard. We then don't, don't do a precision recall analysis, analysis. However, we look into the common no notions that are used in the field, such as full splice matches, FSM, and not in catalogs, NIC, to analyze our data. And this anal anal analysis I want to show you here. So you can see that the uh, ISON form was able to predict more um, or found more predictions than string tie or red. It also found more FSMs. However, if we now look at the unique FSMs, meaning only one prediction should have one uh, should be there for one FSM, then we find that ISON form falls a little bit short of string tie, but still performs quite a bit better as uh, than Rattle did, which give, gives us the same idea as we already saw in the SIM and SURF data set that ISON form had a better recall than Rattle. We also find that Isonform was able to um, recover um, most NICs of all three tools. And yeah, unique NICs, you can see there's almost no difference between NICs and unique NICs. But now I want to show you how the unique FSMs and NICs are shared between the tools. So here you can see that all three tools were able to predict almost 5,000 FSMs in common. However, Rattle was not able to predict on almost 2,400 FSMs that Isonform and string type found in the data. For NICs, you can see that there are only eight NICs in common for all three tools. However, Isonform and string type find uh, 52 NICs that Rattle does not find. But you still see that for each tool, there are some um, NICs that no other tool finds. Now I want to show you the runtime of our data or of our um, analysis. 
And um, so we used um, the Drosophila data set for our runtime analysis and ran it on the cluster, cluster red Rackham. So string tie here is a little bit out of the competition. I, I still want to show it to you where well, they have a peak memory usage of 11.1 gigabytes and a total runtime of six minutes. However, as string tie 2 is a reference-based tool, it's a bit out of the competition for us. We only are interested in how well Redland and the ISON pipeline perform um, as we are looking in the analysis of re reference-free tools. So well, Redl cluster has a peak memory usage of 44.4 gigabytes for our data set and a total runtime of six hours and 20 minutes. I, the ISOM pipeline has a peak memory usage of 23.5 gigabytes and a total runtime of almost 24 hours. However, please keep in mind that RATL as well as string type 2 were implemented in C++ and both already are already published for a while and therefore have been optimized a bit. While the ISOM pipeline um, was um, was programmed in the Python programming language, which is known to be a bit um, slower than C++, as well as we still hope to introduce some improvements on the runtime and find some runtime bottlenecks to um, fix. So with that, I want to conclude my talk with uh, the following points. Well, I introduced to you ISON form, which is a reference which is a tool for reference-free transcriptome prediction. We believe that ISON form may be very suitable as an orthogonal method to reference-based tools due to the facts that I showed you before that um, Elaga found um, differences between tools. Well, also we believe that ISON form is very well able of identifying isoforms for less known organisms or genes. And as a big future work for us, we want to improve the runtime and already have started to do so since the publication of our tool. With that, I want to uh, um, thank um, my supervisor, Christopher Salin, who um, very much helped me developing this tool. I also want to thank my home university as well as SciLife Lab. And with that, I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>